Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. My guest today, we're having a fabulous conversation. This is a conversation about couples therapy, y'all. Gosh, you know, I hear so many questions about couples therapy um, in my Facebook group, in on social media, people message me about this. And, you know, how do you know when you should or should not go to couples therapy with someone? What's the test? What's the litmus test? Well, we have the answers here today for you. But before we get into my episode, um, I just wanted to let you know of a couple of things. One is thank you to those of you who did donate to the Thrive Fund last week that I talked about in the intro last week. It's really amazing, um, your generosity and your outpouring. And, you know, the more we raise, the more we're able to support the more women we're able to support. So please, 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 if you haven't already done so, head on over to the thrivefund.org, the thrivefund.org, and make your donation to support women getting uh, to safety. And also, you know, I haven't talked about my program for a while. <laughs> I just feel like I should talk to you guys about it again. Um, my program, Should I Stay or Should I Go, is... Well, I mean, let's just put it this way. It's fucking amazing. <laughs> no, I mean it. I mean, it really is. The women who have gone through it, they say that it is it is absolutely life changing. They say that it is the burning bush, right? If you're looking for a burning bush to tell you what to do to get clarity on your situation, this program is it. And, you know, the other thing is people are always like, but if I'm already made the decision, should I still go through the program? Yes, absolutely. Because it is completely transformational and foundational to any healthy and functioning relationship. And so as one of one of my former clients actually said, that's a direct quote. And so this is how we heal. Because you've heard me say it a million times. 50% of first marriages end in divorce, 68% of second marriages also end in divorce, and 74% of third marriages do too, which means that if you don't do the work now to figure out what went wrong, right, whether that's because you're still in it or you're out of it, you are more likely to repeat those patterns. Now, if you are the kind of person who's like, I've basically dated the same person over and over and over again in a different body, with a different career, with a different wardrobe, with a different haircut, but like at the end of the day, they're all the same. This program is for you, my friend. So <laughs> I have another, another client who said it's better and worth more than nearly all the money I've spent in therapy for real because it's more directive, right? It really can give you a lot uh, more information. Um, here's another testimonial. She says, I was hesitant to enroll in should I stay or should I go because I was so unsure of everything. But every single module, every video, every worksheet helped me tremendously. I'm not exaggerating when I say that I'm a different person than I was when I started this program. So if that sounds like something that you want for your life and for yourself, please head on over to my website, kateanthony.com slash should I stay, that's hyphenated, should hyphen I hyphen stay, <laughs> or click the link in the show notes. Or if you head to my website, you know it's just kateanthony.com. There is a tab at the top that says should I stay. Click on that. Now, let's get to my guest today, Meredith Shirey. I love Meredith, she's one of those people that I met, I don't know, on the internet or something. 
<laughs> where I meet everybody. And then we got on a call and we were like, yeah, get there, get there, get there. she's fabulous. She is a licensed psychotherapist specializing in relationally based issues. And she's the founder of her New York City based private practice. And she's a host of the podcast, Love Me or Leave Me, and has contributed to articles featured in the New York Times, Today.com, NBC.com. She is just fabulous. She has communication tips for couples, guidance for couples planning to cohabitate or marry, all sorts of stuff. She works with attachment theory, emotionally focused therapy. Listen, all of my favorite stuff. (laughs) All of it. So today we're having an awesome conversation all about therapy, couples therapy. Should you go to couples therapy? Should you, what should you expect out of couples therapy? What should you be looking for in a couples therapist? What are some do's and don'ts? Really awesome and important conversation. So Without further ado, please welcome my guest, Meredith Shirey. Hey, Meredith. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about the do's and don'ts of therapy. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Now, we've talked on the podcast before about about therapy. We've talked about like how to choose a good therapist, which I think would be great to like reiterate. But, you know, I think the first, the first question that I think a lot of people struggle with is when to go to individual versus when to go to couples. Right. Yeah. And I'm going to first give you the really annoying therapist answer and tell you it depends. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone's, everyone's situation is very, very unique and individual. So because it depends and depends on everybody else, the biggest thing I would say is make sure to have a consultation with whatever therapist you're interested in potentially working with and talk about the options, especially if if you're like, you know, I'm not sure which one fits best for me. Talk to the therapist about it and hopefully they can give you some insight to say, okay, here's what I'm thinking. So with that in mind though, and again, again, taking all of this with a grain of salt, because it's all very individual, there are a few things that I think are helpful in thinking about that, right? So one, making sure you have a good qualified therapist. If you're going to couples therapy, I really, really recommend going to a licensed marriage and family therapist. A little biased, that is that is my, <laughs> what yeah, I'm yeah. licensed in. But it's because doing individual versus couple therapy is so, so different. It's two completely different animals. And so you really do need to have someone who is trained specifically in working with couples. So that's my one caveat to that piece. Now, some other things that I think people can think about is one thing, what is it that you're wanting to get out of therapy and what do you think you're going to be addressing? So if you go into individual therapy and you're going to be talking about your partner the entire time, those are usually situations where I say, hey, why don't we try couples therapy? Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. might actually benefit from that. So that's one time when couple therapy can be really good. Couple therapy is also really, really helpful if both of you are invested in the relationship and wanting to work towards a shared goal. Not always. You can have mixed agendas. That's something we deal with. But having at least some semblance of we're both working towards X is very, very helpful Mm -hmm. because it also gives you both an understanding of where where the other person's starting without having to wander, right, which is helpful. And usually, too, when you have two people who are interested in pursuing the same goal, and if it's something like saying we want to work on our communication, we've had a trust rupture, we want to do some repair – there's something joining in that that allows them both to say we have the buy-in for the relationship and it's not just about like my goals versus your goals. And mm-hmm. that is really, really conducive to couple therapy. Now, yeah, I mean, in couples, right, the the deal is that the relationship is the client, right? The exactly. therapist is the is the therapist for the relationship, not for either or. Yes. So right. So the buy-in for the relationship is actually pretty mandatory, right? Because <laughs> Because if the client isn't empowered, in this case, it would be the the relationship, then like, exactly. that's it. <laughs> right? That's actually a very, very important point because if there's a huge power discrepancy, so a big power differential in which one person, not something that's unintended because there's sometimes a little bit of an unintended power imbalance that can be easily remedied. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about that. We're talking about when it is one abusive. person. Exactly. Abusive. 
Mm -hmm. When it's abusive, couple therapy is actually what we call in the business contraindicated, meaning it's actually not ethical for us to give you couple therapy. And one few litmus tests you can use to see if you fall under that is one, do you feel like you're going to be able to be completely honest about what you need and how you're feeling in front of your partner and the therapist? If the answer is no, don't do couple therapy. Mm -hmm. If And I'm going to say this again with a huge amount of compassion and zero judgment around this. If you are not willing to change your behavior, because maybe you don't need to, right? If you're in an abusive relationship, you should not be trying to change yourself so this person stops abusing you, right? Mm Because this isn't your fault. So again, with a compassion caveat around that, that's a time too when individual therapy is probably going to be better for you. Right. Also, if you're checked out, if you are doing this to literally just check the box, please don't do couple therapy. You're going to mm. end up hurting and making that breakup much worse. Mm. So, you know. So that's interesting because I have a lot of people who are like, I just, I'm not, like, I'm done. I know I'm done, but I do feel like I need to check that box. I do feel like I just, like, I want to be able to say I tried everything. Right. Yeah. Right. And you're saying no. Well, so. It's one of those things where I think if people look at couple therapy as though it's going to be some magic bullet, it will not be and Mm -hmm. might have a, what you might call a quote unquote bad outcome or or a poor taste of of what couple therapy is. So you can, I would say if it's something though, where, you know, there is no chance, like you are past the point of no return, right? You've you've crossed the Rubicon, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Your partner is not, and it's just your way of hoping that they'll get on board with you wanting to end the relationship. It's not going to work. There's like a, it's disingenuous, right? To sign up for couples therapy with the intention of ending your marriage, right? Like the, unless the, unless the, unless the therapist knows this, right. And is like, right. I mean, there, and that's, that's something that I think people struggle with a lot, Right. I need to tell him in an environment that feels safe and is contained and that'll help him process it and help me feel safe in doing so. But like, you don't spring that on the therapist (laughs) in your (laughs) session, right? I have had like a few couples break up on my couch and it's the most awkward thing in the world. It's like, I'd rather be anywhere else. And I'm like, at the end of the day, like, okay, maybe Starbucks is hiring. I can't do this anymore. (laughs) But, but yeah, please don't spring it on the therapist. And and if you are in a situation where you do need to have this third person present, that's fine. So I think what we're talking about is more of if you're going to be surprising your partner with the breakup, therapy might not be a good place to do it. If you need to do it for safety reasons, I would recommend you find a public place. And then if you need to do some therapy follow up to just kind of hold this person accountable, Sometimes, and and there's a very, very, very thin, thin, thin line in this. Sometimes with relationships that are kind of on that abuse borderline, in the beginning, it can actually be helpful for for those partners to be in couple therapy with the with their victim because usually when there's another set of eyes, they behave a little better. Right. But again, thin line, and there's a huge drop off quickly. So the second you take that turn where it stops being safe and safer for the person who's being victimized you have to stop immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, and that's the thing is that like, there is that, there is that line there. They may be on great behavior when other people around, but as soon as you walk out that office, you're, you're no longer safe. You're no longer protected. So in that, in those cases, you want to make sure that you have other systems in place to protect you. Absolutely. Right. One thing I actually really recommend, and I know there's a lot of there's a lot of debate on if concurrent therapy is helpful. So doing individual and couple is helpful to do at the same time. Mm -hmm. It totally depends on your situation, but I would say that in those situations where you have someone who again is kind of borderline abusive, making sure that it's a situation where they're willing to sign a release to have the individual therapist talk to the couple's therapist and vice versa so that everyone can get on the same page. Mm -hmm. That can be very, very helpful because again, then the individual therapist is not just getting the woe is me sob story which a good therapist will be able to see through that anyway. Mm-hmm. But at least if they then have the cu- the context of couples, they can really, really hold that person accountable and challenge them. Now, most of the time, people who are abusive tend to have personality disorder traits. So most of the time, you know, people do not go into the therapist's office and say, you know, I think I'm a narcissist and I think I'm <laughs> abusing my partner. <laughs> and, you know, I would really like to change me. And I'd love to work on that. Like, what yeah. can I do? Right. That doesn't, right. It's all about how can I maintain power and control? Exactly. Right. I mean, that's the, that's the abuser's 
sort of tagline, power and control, power and control. So let's just, I just want to go back to this idea that it is, it is unethical for a therapist to engage in couples therapy with someone who is abusive. Yes, with a big asterisk, because again, there's always a defense. <laughs> so the times when it really draws a line of like, you cannot do this is if there is, again, this very clear power differential that is someone is especially emotional abuse, someone is emotionally manipulative, they're withholding, they're financially abusive, and God knows if they've been physically abusive mm-hmm. and if it's one-sided. So this is the big difference. So if it's one person who, who is the aggressor and the other person who is, we'll call them the victim or the survivor, then you cannot do couples therapy. It's considered contraindicated because the therapist is not going to take one person's side. But in doing that, in not taking sides when there's an abusive situation, you are actually yes. perpetuating the abuse because it's silently condoning the abuse by not being able to challenge it directly, which is why... It's a lot easier, I think, on the therapist end if you find that out before you actually start working with them. So one thing I always recommend for people to do is to have a consultation with the therapist. Again, talk about individual versus couple. And especially if you're doing couples work, when I'm potentially going to work with a new couple, I actually have a policy now where I say we have to do a phone consultation and I want both of you to be on the call because that can give me an an indication of, okay, is one person withdrawn, you know, as someone trying to talk over the other person, it really helps me to start sussing out, okay, is this a problem or not? Right. You know, because again, it's, it's harder once you have people on your couch to, to ethically then terminate treatment without a really good rationale for it. And that's really hard when you're in an abusive situation, because you can't say to them, it's because you're abusing her, because that could potentially make that person more at danger too. So it's, it's really, really, Mm -hmm. really tricky. So if you even think that you might be in an abusive relationship, consultation with the therapist first, before you have a consultation with your partner. And if you and the therapist decide, okay, maybe this is worth exploring couples work. Okay, great. Do one with your partner, see how it feels, but be honest with yourself, with your therapist about what works and what doesn't. If you feel uncomfortable If you feel like when you leave that therapy session, if you're actually honest about what's going on, you're going to get some blowback. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Okay. Do individual. Right. And it's, it's interesting. I remember my couples therapists (laughs) telling us that they believe that individual therapy leads to divorce. Mm -hmm. But they, (laughs) well, it's actually really interesting, right? They were like, they don't believe in individual therapy because they believe they're imago trained. So And so they really Uh, believe that all of your personal issues are worked out in the, in the couple's dynamic. Right. I do not believe that. So they, so their, their theory is that like, they're like, every time we've had clients go to individual therapy, the relationship hasn't worked out. Yeah. I think I see where they're coming from in that rationale, but I think, and this might be what you're getting at. There is the inherent assumption that those are healthy, egalitarian right. relationships. And yeah. if you don't have that, this dynamic, exactly. dynamic might not right. work. Exactly. And so that's know? what I was going to say is that like, so I went to, I went to individual, I was an individual, we were in couples, we were in a group imago setting as well. And, but it was, I think the individual therapy that did lead me to lead me to leave my marriage because it actually, first of all, my, I, I don't believe my ex was being particularly honest in our, in our couples setting and Mm -hmm. it was emotionally abusive. And so I was, and so the, the individual therapy empowered me and like it, by the way, I did not have a therapist who was like, you need to leave your marriage or anything like that. I just started to grow as a person and as an individual and I, and my self-esteem grew and my strength grew until finally this no longer, this no longer fit. Right. Like I always say that with my clients that doing the individual work, like do the individual work because you grow into your full potential. And then you try to put on this coat that used to fit you when you were smaller, (laughs) physically, you know, you know, uh, metaphorically, and it it no longer fits. And that's just not, it's like, it's not right or wrong. It's just, oh, this no longer fits. And I think Right. And I think that some, and I, and I think that that's sort of where my 
maybe my my therapists were or the couples therapists were sort of talking about but i hear a lot of <laughs> it's really funny in my facebook group there are a lot of husbands that get really pissed off at their wives for starting individual therapy because they're like you go to therapy people get divorced and it's like well <laughs> That's because she realized that she can do better than you, buddy. Then that sounds like a you issue that you got to exactly. fix. You. So exactly. Hello. <laughs> well, I think it's 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 a tricky it's a tricky tricky situation. Again, very individualized to what's going on with you. But it sounds like in your situation, you needed that empowerment, right? Because if there's not another lens, if there's not another way to reality test what's going on, then it's easy to get swept up in the abuse and to continue thinking, okay, this is my fault. You know, I'm, I'm the one who's the problem. And you need that other voice to help you to challenge those thoughts to say, wait, hold on a sec. This, this, I don't know that that's a you thing. Oppositely though, what I've also seen happen from time to time is that people go to individual therapy, won't sign release or anything, and then come in and weaponize what their individual therapist said, because they forget that individual therapy is an echo chamber. Again, some situations you really need that echo chamber because you need to hear your own voice maybe for the first time. But for other people, <laughs> if it's something where they're already rigid and you know, not wanting to, to change, but they're wanting to stay in the relationship, then that, that can be problematic. So right. Right. don't right. weaponize what your therapist says. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Right. I mean, I hear that all the time that like, I mean, I have, th- I have clients whose husbands are in individual therapy and also have psychiatrists, mm-hmm. right? And they clearly are like severely mentally ill and mentally disordered. Right. And they're like, why isn't his therapist? Like, I don't get it. Like, why isn't the therapist picking up on it? And it's like, well, they might be, they might be, but like, what can they do? It's tricky because either they are. And so here's the really, <sighs> Again, this is why personality disorders are so, so, so difficult because it's this cyclic cycle and this feedback loop of this, the thing they need to work on the most is also the thing that scares them the most. So it's almost like every time you get close to them talking about them and being vulnerable for a second, they take about 10 steps back. And so you have to kind of go through this pattern a lot of times for years and years. Mm. And so it's really difficult for the therapist who might hear it and think, hmm, I don't know that that's true what the client's telling me. But then it's the game of saying, okay, do I challenge them? Or if I challenge them now, is it going to be too early? And they're not going to take the chance to work. Different situation is sometimes people who are on the personality disorder spectrum are really, really good at crafting a narrative and telling the individual therapist something that sounds so terrible, right? Because it's a crafted reality and it's not based on actual fact. And so if the therapist is only hearing this one side of this, right? right. And thinks, oh my God, you're right. You're horrible right? It's, it is easy to then validate how terrible it is because again, it's not based on fact. It's based on this very convoluted version of their reality. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor today. For over a decade, I've helped divorcing moms put their children at the center of all of their decisions. So whenever I hear about moms struggling to co-parent with an ex that abuses alcohol, I have one system in mind, Soberlink. Soberlink's alcohol monitoring system is the most convenient, reliable, and reasonable way for a parent to provide evidence that they're not drinking during parenting time. Soberlink's real-time alerts, facial recognition, and tamper detection ensure the integrity of each test, so you can be confident your kids are with a sober parent. With Soberlink, judges rest assured that your child is safe, Attorneys get court-admissible evidence of sobriety, and both parents have empowerment and peace of mind. Trust the experts in remote alcohol monitoring technology to keep you informed and your kids safe and secure. For an exclusive $50 off your device and to download the resource I created with Soberlink, Checklist for High Conflict Divorces, visit Soberlink.com slash DSG. And now back to our show what do I tell my clients or what do, what do we tell the listeners who have husbands who are in therapy and they know they're not being honest. And I have clients who are like, can I call the therapist? <laughs> I'm like, no, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> right? You can't. What, what do you tell people in that situation? I completely empathize with this sentiment 
behind, like if I just called them and told them all the things about my partner, then they would change it and that'd be great, right? I think the thing people have to remember though is your partner is defended and creating this reality because of something within them that needs to defend, right? That needs to distort. And so if you if you're in the situation, right? You can talk to your partner and just say, hey, can you help me understand like, or how's therapy helping you? Is it helping you? Now, one thing I tell people, especially if they're in couple and individual therapy is individual therapy is your own. You do not have any rights to demand information about that. It can be shared. And when it can be shared, honestly, it can be a really beautiful processing and bonding, bonding thing, but you don't have the right to demand to know what happens in the therapy session or you have to like call your, your partner's right. therapist and say, Any let me more just tell than you. You want them to know what, you know, is happening in your therapy, right? Exactly. It's sacred. It's very Absolutely. sacred. Mm-hmm. Very sacred. So in that event, what you have to do is to, I think, honestly, talk to your own individual therapist about it and have some reality testing to say, okay, why would this person be distorting what's going on in therapy? If this person continues to do that, is it making the problems in our relationship better or worse? And then what do I want to do with that? Because I have no control over what they do, right? Right. You know, just like you can't call the therapist, you also can't go in there and talk for your your partner. And I think people get very confused sometimes about what's within their control and what's not, right? There's nothing you can do that can change what this other person is going to do, right? Now you're responsible for your behavior and you have a responsibility to them as their partner, but if they want to abuse you, they're going to do that regardless of what you do. If right. if they want to change, that's because they've decided they want, they to, want change. to change. Right, exactly. And for most of us who are engaged in some kind of relationship with someone who's either has personality disorders or mental illness or mental disorders or is abusive, all of that stuff, like anything on that in that spectrum or in the narcissism spectrum, we tend to suffer from codependency. Those are the, that's the hand in hand, right? Oh, yeah. And a huge issue with codependence is understanding what we have control over and what we don't. And we work so tirelessly to try to control the other person. And we don't control our own actions and our own. And it takes so long for us to get to that. Like, can you talk about that? what that shift is, right? Between like, why do we want to try to control them? And we feel so powerless about ourselves when we literally have it backwards. Right. (laughs) Just from a clinical standpoint, right? Yeah. And I'm going to say this too, again, with a ton of love and compassion, I'm going to call myself maybe perhaps a recovering codependent. Yeah, Um, me too. (laughs) <laughs> and you know, and I, I get, you know, it's funny. I don't, I don't know how you feel. How do you feel about the term codependent itself? Sometimes I feel like it's almost like it can be off putting to people if you tell them, Hey, you're codependent. So yeah, I think I, I, I hear all the time that my, my clients who were like, I always was really off put by that as a diagnosis or whatever. And then I started reading about it and I was like, Oh, <laughs> Right. And I think that it really has to do. I do. I think people are really put off by it because, because I think it has a stigma. It has a social stigma, right? It means that you're weak. It means that you're, I don't know, like, what do we make it? We make it mean something that it really doesn't. Right. Yeah. And I would agree with that. So the term codependent actually came out of substance abuse Mm -hmm. counseling and that kind of thing. And really, so And I think this is what happens. And I know I have seen this happen, especially living in New York, more times than I really want to count, you know, with um, especially heterosexual males. Yes. Trying to tell females that they are codependent as a way to shame them for being relational. And it's like, they're not being codependent. They're being relational. So that's where I get kind of tripped up with, with a... Just a simple label sometimes because it's like, it is very, very stigmatizing. It's a loaded word. So I think though, if we can separate out and say, okay, if we're calling you codependent, what do you need to understand about yourself? And to also draw the line between codependent involves two people. So like you were saying before, hand in hand, they literally are the yin and the yang. One is a taker, one is a giver. And you have to have both of those people to be able to create a codependent relationship. Yes. Now you can be a caretaker, right? But you also need to back off and have some reciprocity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. I, I remember. No, it's so, it's so, it's so complicated. I remember being on a date with a guy who was a 
an alcoholic, of course, one and only date. And he, he was like, he said something like he wanted some water and I was going to the bathroom. So I was like, Oh, I'll grab it for you. He goes, don't be codependent. And I was like, he doesn't know actually, you. I was oh. like, I'm actually just being kind. There's a difference. Like codependent. Cause I'm going to the bathroom and I'm passing the bar and I will get you water on my way back. Like, fuck off. I should have just left, but <laughs> it's a whole other story. But because I am codependent, right. My initial, my initial thing was like, I mean, I did say like, that's not codependency. That's just kindness. Right. But my own codependency is like what had me stay. Right. And because, because 25 years of personal development work and I'm still, you know, we still struggle with this stuff because it was, but it, but I did not go on a second date with a man and I, and I <laughs> just, just well, FYI. And you did, you did the right thing. And I think that's a thing though. Right. And especially the whole codependency and the female piece. Right. So yeah, we have all these years that we're trying to work on ourselves and try to establish more assertiveness, but we also have a couple thousand years of socialization and you know, intergenerational trauma of what it's like for women, because sometimes it's like, we are the polite girl, the nice girl, because if we don't, we fear what it means for our safety. So I don't know that you did the wrong thing there because it might've actually been safer for you to, to just wait it out with a guy for the next hour, but you did the right thing by not going on another date with him. (laughs) Fuck. Yeah, I did. (laughs) That was the tip of the iceberg with that one, but yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and I think you're right. Like we have to give ourselves the, the pass or the grace to really just say like, this is not, this is, this is, this is thousands of years of conditioning, certainly hundreds, hundreds of patriarchal times of conditioning for us to be nice. And, and some of that by some of that is some of that codependency is a fucking safety mechanism. It is our own safety because if you have a violent abuser, whether that's emotional violence, physical violence, financial violence, you know, that if you fight back or say something contrary, that the results are are going to be dangerous. Right. And right. that is actually exactly why couple therapy for when it's the one-way violence is yeah. contraindicated for that exact reason. That if it's if you being honest is going to make it unsafe for you, that is not okay. Right. And we can't be complicit in that. And you're exactly right about that. And I actually have a client I'm working with right now who this is something that we have to have a very recent conversation about this because in any other situation, I would say you need to be honest about what you need. Don't just let these behaviors slide. But if she were to do that right now, it would make it incredibly dangerous for her. Yeah. Incredibly dangerous. So she's having to swallow a lot. And we've had to make this divide though, to say you were literally tourniqueting a wound. So you don't bleed out. This is not a sustainable pattern. This is not tenable for the long term. This is just to get you to a safe place where you can get out. Yes, exactly. And I talk to my clients about that, about like, this is strategy, right? So there's a difference between sort of a caged animal who is being controlled and manipulated and and either doesn't know it or knows it and just doesn't, can't do anything about it. And someone who's like, ah, okay, the game that I have to play here Mm-hmm. is compliance while I make a plan behind the scenes, right? And the second that it is shifted from not conscious to strategy, that's when you start to take back some of your power, right? And a lot of my clients are like, but but then he's winning. And I'm like, oh, he thinks he's winning, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? He thinks he is, but that's not, but but this is strategy, Exactly. And and I think that that is such a beautiful distinction to make. And before, I think you were asking about, okay, how does someone get to that shift, right? How does someone get to that point of reckoning to say, I now want to take back my power and create a strategy for myself that benefits me rather than me just responding to whatever nonsense this other person is doing. Mm-hmm. So it's this idea of like, you know, moving from responding to choosing. Right. And so, yes, that process is so different for everybody. And I think that it's really, I, I hate how hard it is because it is so hard because a lot of times in the midst of this, and you've probably experienced this with your own clients, is that 
the abuser goes through these fun little cycles where for just a moment, they will give you that glimpse of what they were like in the beginning when they were being kind to you. And it gives you, it puts you on this really, really awful cycle of feeling hopeful because they give you just enough of a breadcrumb to say, maybe this time's different. Yeah. See, he's trying. He says to try, but I just need to be patient. And that is such a tricky and just heartbreaking pattern because they are doing just the bare minimum to make sure to keep you and to make you question yourself. Yep. And that's yep. the thing is it's, it's abuse. It's right. still, the, and you know, it's funny, like client I was telling you about, she asked me the other day and, you know, is he ever going to change? And usually we do the therapy thing and process and say, well, I'm gonna, and I, for some reason, it's probably my own stuff that came up. Like in about half a second, I was like, Nope. <laughs> He's not gonna do it. And she was like, oh, okay. <laughs> right, right. As a coach, I get to say that. <laughs> that's a, that's oh, a great goodness. distinction. That's actually a great distinction between therapy and coaching is that as a coach, I'm like, no, he's not going to change. <laughs> well, apparently I did that as a therapist. Might probably shouldn't have. <laughs> right, right. Most ther- therapists, right, exactly. But I, but as a coach, I'm, I'm free to say <laughs> what I'm thinking. Oh, uh, I ended up in that way, so. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to, I, I can't imagine I mean, by the way, just like, I'm not good at not saying what I want to say at any moment anyway. So like, oh, I don't think that's why I'm not a therapist. That's why I literally <laughs> chose not to be a therapist. So, okay. So individual versus couples. I think we sort of like covered. So how do you, okay, let's say, let's say you do choose couples. Mm-hmm. How do you do that? Like what, I don't think, I feel like there should be a class in like, how do you do couples therapy? Right. right. Like how, how, how do you do couples therapy? How do you, how do you make the most out of it? And like, know that you're like doing it quote, right. <laughs> and you're not just sitting there like, well, he, well, he, will he, you know, I know a lot of couples therapists, a lot of people who go to couples therapy and they're like, I don't know. I just sit there and like, he says everything I'm doing wrong. And then I say everything he's doing wrong. And then like, I don't know, like what's going on. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. Exactly. So those people, I always ask, uh-huh. And how do you feel when you leave? Mm-hmm. How do you feel the next day? Not any better? Because I think, and some of this is human nature that we, again, talking about changing the other person in the similar but opposite way, we also think, okay, well, the way that this is going to, this problem is going to get fixed is they need to change. I'm not going to do anything different. I don't have to. But uh-huh. they, they need to do some work. Or I'm going to keep doing my thing. They're going to keep doing their thing. And magically, somehow, something's going to happen differently. Mm, no. When we say it like that, right? It sounds so silly. It's like, oh, right. No, that's not. Right. But the thing is, and again, this is where I'm going to say this with some compassion, is that it is human nature to fear change. And with change, there's discomfort because you're walking into the unknown. And that's why we go back to those patterns that are familiar because our brains like to have those known answers rather than the unknowns. So you're going to be uncomfortable. So lesson number one for making the most out of couples therapy, get comfortable with discomfort. Mm Mm-hmm. You're going to be pushed to try new things. You're going to have to take accountability for yourself. And so I think that, yes, I wish there was like a tutorial video for people saying, you know, here's what to expect in couples therapy and to say, like, are you willing to do X, Y, and Z? If not, maybe don't do this. Don't, don't waste your money. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So what's X, Y, and Z? Like, look at your shit, change your behaviors, right? So a lot of it is that, yeah. A lot of it is like taking ownership for you. So one of the biggest things is check your your expectations before you come in here. Again, if your expectation is they get to change and I just get to dictate to them how they're going to change, not going to work. If your expectation is I want to go into with the with the expectation of quote unquote winning, it will not work. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something to the effect of the person who wins in the short term is the long-term loser because the relationship suffers because the person who quote unquote lost will feel forever resentful because right. it's not about winning or losing. You right. know, I, I try to talk to people about this because everyone has their own perspective. Right. And again, your couple therapist is not your judge, jury, your litigator. And why would you want to litigate your relationship and to pick apart your partner like that? If you're trying to mend the relationship, how is that going to benefit you? Because the couple's therapist is not coming home with you to be like, yeah, what a jerk that guy was. The person you were just calling a jerk for an hour is coming home with you. Right. So if your goal is to mend the relationship, going in and just thinking that, again, you're going to sling some mud is not going to help. And because, again, they will sling that mud right back at you. Don't, don't make a mistake about that. 
That's human nature. So if you can go in and if your goal is, okay, I want to understand what I'm doing to contribute to this issue, problem, whatever. And I want to understand more for my partner, what's going on for them so that it's, we're both trying to understand one another to get past the barrier. So it's no longer you versus me. It's us together versus whatever this problem is. Right. 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 Mm Mm-hmm. That I think those are some of the, like the big ground yeah. ones. Is, again, don't expect your therapist to litigate. Don't don't go in thinking you need to win. And also, again, don't go in expecting your ther- the therapist to take your side because again, they're if they're doing their job correctly, they won't, or they're at least going to be balanced, right? Mm-hmm. So that, mm-hmm. they're not going to do it without allowing the other person. And also, too, this should probably go without saying, but it needs to be said, you are going to have a very different reality than your partner. So I used to do this intervention. I haven't done it in a while, COVID, where when it seemed like these people just really, they're almost, again, trying to litigate, you know, like, no, this is what happened. No, this is what happened. You know, and they're trying to litigate what the facts were and what the facts weren't, right? When we know that that's not actually the important piece. And when they're doing that, they are missing each other. So this intervention, I can't remember if I got it from God under who, but what I would do is I would say, okay, I'm going to give you both a piece of paper, turn you back to back. And I want you to draw this room. That is the only, the only direction I'm going to give you. Okay. Now, why is your drawing of this room more right than the other person's, you know, or even oppositely making them switch and say, you need to argue why their drawing is more accurate to, to the assignment than your partner's was, than yours was. And it's just a really experiential way to help people to realize like, oh, we're going to draw completely different pictures and that's okay. Yeah. That's it's perspective fine. work. It's all yeah. perspective. It's perspective work. Yeah. I love that. I love that. It's so, I've seen it also done with the six and the nine, right? Like, Oh no, I haven't heard of that one. <laughs> well, like you just draw a six, right. And you hand it to them with facing one. So the one person it's a six and the other person it's a nine. Oh, that makes sense. Right. And like, nobody's yeah. wrong. <laughs> Right. It's both. It's from my perspective, it's a six. From your perspective, it's a nine. Right. And that was, I think that that level of empathy work was one of the greatest gifts I got out of Imago Mm. because of the process being so rigid to be able to have to mirror the other person and summarize their experience and not be able to uh, comment on it or argue about it or anything like that, to just actually be present with someone else's perspective, knowing that it's true for them, that's Empathy 101. And it's so challenging. It's so, so challenging. So you could basically got a crash course in how to do discomfort, right? And it it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, and you don't have to disclose if you don't want to, but did you find that, okay, because it sounds like, you know, you had to, again, make a lot of space and hold on to a lot of things you probably vehemently disagreed with, right? Mm -hmm. You know, finding that empathy. Did you find that your partner was giving it back to you? Do you find that there was an equal balance or was that something that made you go, okay, this is not, this is not working? He was really good at it. I guess I think that in the room and in the moment and stuff like he actually did, he really did mean it, right? He's he's very, he's complex. But then we would leave the room and he was still cheating on me. So it didn't really matter, right? Or so, and and also I do think he weaponized a lot of what he learned about me in those, in those sessions, right? Like, and that's the hard, that's the hard part is because you do have to sort of open yourself up vulnerably and so talk about your childhood wounding and how what's happening is triggering you. And then it's just like, well, you're just triggered. Like, it's not me. It's your, and so it's, <laughs> so oh my God. Let me, I, you know, talking about bad dates, by the way, we could probably have a completely separate podcast on de- like talking about bad dates no and like, shit. oh my God. Yeah. I don't know what that would be called, but I'm sure we could, we'll figure it out. Anyway, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing, right? Like nothing sends me into white hot rage more than hearing men or like, you know, having my clients tell me about this or, or, you know, when I've been on dates and having men try to minimize and downplay whatever you're telling them is happening when you're expressing a need or saying, Hey, I need this differently. Right. And again, you're not being, you're not being critical necessarily, but you're, you're needing them to take some responsibility. And then they turn it back on you, especially when it's something vulnerable. That's, that was weaponized. Yeah. That, that goes, makes me go zero to a (laughs) hundred real quick. And then you go zero to a hundred and now you're crazy. 
Dude, she was psycho, man. She was like fucking like, psycho. Or maybe she was flooded because you you did something that made her central nervous system hijack her brain and her prefrontal cortex shut down. I mean, that's not a real by the way. That's not a real popular <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i love you that's so great so perfect so all right so how do you know when to you know there's uh, one of the things that i've that i've learned in the last many years is that like really not all therapists are created equal and i was talking to friends of mine who came out of a therapy program and they would tell me about like the people that they're graduating with and i'm like dude like why are they graduating these people and they're like because it's a factory a lot of these programs are just factories <sighs> So there are a lot of bad therapists out there, right? Like, and by the way, there are also a lot of bad coaches. So how do you know if you have a good therapist, what are you looking for in a therapist? I think that's important. And honestly, thank you for bringing attention to the training programs, because that was something I actually, I I very, very lucky. And I count myself extremely blessed for this. I went to a very good training program. Uh, It was actually not in marriage and family therapy. It was in mental health counseling. So I got this really nice balance of the deep, deep clinical knowledge and and, in that side, Mm -hmm. and then also got a lot of the couple therapy experience in that training. So getting to apply both and I had wonderful supervision. So yeah. I'm so grateful for that program. And I did not realize until I actually started taking on trainees and interns myself that not everybody has that experience yeah. in that program. It, it's, it is alarming. So I think, yes, look at the program that your therapist went to. Mm-hmm. Is it a ranked program? Is it something where they, uh, I don't want to disparage online schools, but what has their training been like? So that I think is something that's very, very important. What's their experience been like? And really, and honestly, one of the biggest things with that kind of going down that rabbit hole of the training piece and needing to understand what this world is and what good training is and isn't, how do you feel when you're with this person? Yeah. Right. Do you feel safe? Do you feel comfortable? Are you able to be honest? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things that I always look for in, in a therapist is I need someone who like, I don't feel like this, not, and this is a terrible word to use, but like, I don't feel like the smartest person in the room. <laughs> right. I remember going to a therapist once and she was like, and she sort of like, listened to me for a while. And then she was like, you're very emotionally intelligent. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, thanks. And she, and she really, honestly, I don't think she knew what to do with that. And I was like, okay, I can't, I can't. Like if, if you like, I, I, look, I am advanced in my emotional development process. So I need a therapist who can like, is going to be ahead of me. Right. Right. And who isn't threatened. So here's actually the uh-huh. thing that I'm saying that because as you're saying that I'm thinking, I'm like thinking about my clients. I'm like, man, I love the ones who are super insightful and emotionally intelligent because then we can just, yeah, you get in the sandbox. Off. Yeah. And it's great. It's beautiful. And those have honestly been my favorite therapeutic relationships. So I think sometimes if, if you're coming up with that, it might be because that person feels threatened. We don't know what that's about. Maybe if sure. they're new, they're recently out of training, then the idea of, oh my God, thinking I'm supposed to be smarter than every when, than all of my clients. I'm supposed to be in a better place. When I think the real mark of a seasoned good therapist is when they have no need to put on airs with you, right? Right. Again, they get, they can get in the sandbox and that they want to, that they're not trying to be superior. If you have a yeah. therapist who has a God complex and wants you to praise them all the time, Ew. like, please Ew. Yeah. run, yeah. back out, run, run screaming. And by right? the way, yeah, if you're in an abusive relationship in your in your marriage, it is very likely that you're going to or not likely, but it's very possible, probably more possible that you will find yourself in this, this kind of relationship with your therapist. Yeah, or or even another romantic relationship or right. And, and, or your and, work your work relationship or whatever. So, and here's the thing about that. That is it is a heartbreaking thing. And I will say I've been down that road too. And learning to trust yourself again after that is like a never ending journey. Mm. The thing is though, it's not saying, okay, why didn't I see this coming? Right. What's wrong with me? I didn't see this coming because again, sometimes the wolf will show up in sheep's skin and try to keep it on as long as they can to, with the intention to fool you. And that's not your fault that someone was trying to be deceptive ever, right. ever, you know? ever, ever, ever. And because again, smart people 
smart people get into bad situations. And, and again, a combination of probably your own history. And is there something about this dynamic that feels a little normalized to you? So I got out of an abusive relationship several years ago now, and, and it really, I had to have this moment of reckoning with myself actually in a therapy office because several years before that I had actually gotten out of the marriage and, and my marriage ended because I don't think he's an abusive person, but it ended in an abusive situation situation because he thought he was losing control. And so the more he felt me slipping away, the more, you know, the more, the more. So, and then, so fast forward five years later, I'm in this therapist's office and I realize I'm like, oh my God, because after the marriage, I'd promised myself never again, never again, never again. I will never be with someone like that again. And then I had this horrible moment of reckoning that was so necessary where I was like, oh my God, five years later, I'm not only with the same person, I'm with someone who is so much worse. Oh my God, I had the same thing. Same thing. It's a great, horrible moment. It's horrible. It's horrible. And you're like, oh my God, I did it again. And not only did I do it again, I did it, I did it worse. Yep. I did it worse. Yeah. <laughs> and my best friend is Buddhist and he's always the one. He's like, baby, you just like, when you don't learn the lesson the first time, the universe keeps presenting it to you. And sometimes it needs to present it to you like really clearly. <laughs> Like, I'm like a traumatizing way, <laughs> really badly <laughs> before you can be like, oh, okay. I actually, I really, really agree with that. I forget which therapist says we repeat or we, yeah, we repeat what we don't repair. Mm-hmm. And then the other one, Stan, I think it's Stan Tatkin who says this, we find the bite that fits our wound, which yeah. is why you have to go into the, all that really, really awful, hard stuff from your past and your childhood. And because that was something that I had to realize, I'm like, oh, why do I stay in relationships for too long, knowing that I'm miserable and unhappy and I'm not getting what I need? And why do I keep repeating this this cycle of attracting abusive partners who are massively controlling? And it's because I actually had to realize, oh, I've had two relationships with family members that have been abusive my entire life. And I just thought whether it's abusive or not, it's like you just have to stay in it, right? Right. You don't have a choice. And And you equate it with love. Right. That's your your initial attachment yep. is is that you're you've got love and abuse sort of in one. <laughs> so if it's not abusive, it doesn't feel like love. Exactly. And so you get you and this is, again, where our brains try to connect the tissue and where our brains don't like unknowns. They will fill in the gaps, even if the gaps are even if we're doing it incorrectly. And that's that's exactly what happens. Right. Is we repeat what's familiar. And so to tie back in when we're talking about codependent earlier, that is something that I see is almost like, you know, you were involuntarily made to be codependent, probably because you ended up in this cycle that was cyclical and kind of continued because they needed you to need them, right? Mm -hmm. They needed to control you and you wanted to get approval or whatever by appeasing them. And so then it becomes a cycle, Yep. And if that's something that you learn very early in childhood, like appeasing your parents and or not feeling like you can make mistakes and that you're supposed to kind of take care of them versus them taking care of you, you can see how that's what's normalized when you're a kid. And that's your very first experience of love. Yeah. You're, you're set up for it and it's not your fault just because you have this diagnosis of codependency, whether it's a clinical diagnosis or self-diagnosed, right? It doesn't, doesn't mean you're a bad person. It means that you your earliest attachments created something that's, that's needs, needs some work, right? (laughs) It's some finessing. And the more that you can learn about it, my God, the better. I mean, I remember reading my first codependency books and being like, I wanted to throw up, but also I was like, Oh, (laughs) I get all of it now. Oh my gosh. We could talk about this for like hours and we will, we will have more of these conversations. I'm definitely going to have you back on Meredith, where people find you and learn more about you and your work and your podcast, you have a yeah. podcast, which I'm going to be on soon. I know. <laughs> I about that. Yeah. It's so funny. We're like, I think that's how we found each other. Right. We're like, wait, our podcasts are so similar. We've, we've got to do something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my podcast is Love Me or Leave Me. Um, you can go to the Love Me or Leave Me podcast.com. If you're interested in therapy work or you're asking some questions there, even again, if, maybe if you're someone who's a prospective therapist and you want to find a good training program. And you have oh my some God, you guys, really like, seriously. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, please, please feel free to email me. You can find all that information on the website. It's www.relationshipcounselingnyc.com. 
Great. And all of that, all of the information will be in the show notes. And I look forward to having you back and talking more in depth about all of these things really soon. Uh, same. I can't wait to get our, our podcast going on the side about all the bad dates. <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to have to start dating again. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. We can do this. Well, maybe we can do it from memory. Like, we don't need to have <laughs> I don't want to do lots that of those. It's true. It's true. I got lots of them. <laughs> Thank you so much, love. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at the Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.